A handful of bills that, that we labeled resale, and they were to individuals that you probably haven't seen before. So just thought I'd mention those. Those were the, uh, that student advisor group that's reselling prom dresses or formal dresses. So um, those receipts need to come through the school and be re uh, repaid back out. So we're just going to call those resale to see those in the future. So. Any other questions on the bills? No, I didn't. Um, we did have, um, since wrestling's on the agenda later today, and there was a bill in the activity fund um, for wrestling equipment. It was um, practice gear, shorts, that type of thing, uniforms, and the school and the booster club both are, are chipping in on that bill. So some of the stuff was primarily a school expense, but about $700 of it was a shared expense okay. with the booster club. So. Anything else? Okay, so I'd entertain a motion to approve the bill over at six hundred fifty-three dollars and forty cents. Second. Motion is second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries three zero. I'd entertain a motion to approve uh, three sets of minutes, the financial statements, and the remaining bills on account. I like that motion. Second. Motion and second. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries 4 0. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to reports. Uh, or do you want to go ahead and start? Yep, um, the first one I have noted on there is the transitional kindergarten program for the 15 16 school year. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to um, update you on where things are with that. So Mike has some information for you that he'll share. But initially, the info we want to give you is that we were very concerned about whether the program would um, be for pupil funding. Um, and so then the consideration by the board would be would you be interested in having a transitional kindergarten program if the kids in that program, who were all five, could not be counted for, for pupil funding? Because that was kind of our initial understanding. Um, I was at a meeting in Ankeny, um, it's probably been three weeks ago now, and the director of the Department of Education was there, and it must have been on the mind of a lot of superintendents because there were several questions about it. And the director's direct comments were that if they're five and they're in some kind of a kindergarten program in public schools in Iowa, that can be counted as for uh, full per pupil cost. So that sort of eliminated that decision that you probably would have had to make about, so would the district fund it without uh, student aid uh, uh, tax dollars from the state. So with that then, um, Mike and Angela, the teacher and I met last week, we kind of talked through um, the purpose of the program and making sure we're clear about the criteria uh, for the program, size of the program, location, and that sort of thing. And Mike will talk to you about um, sort of what that joint information is. And then he'll also <coughs> share with you how we'll get that out to parents. Thanks, Bart. And we did, the three of us met last week and did have a good, we had a good conversation about what that program, you know, just having the program, which was a big step, and then putting together some criteria and, and know that um, not only did I talk to Angela about the criteria and Barb, I went to both of our preschool teachers. Um, I had Marianne involved because she puts together a lot of data for us, and um, over the years she's actually put together data that would be able to tell a parent um, where a child might look at risk and be kind of, I don't want to say destined, but have a greater opportunity of being um, in our, in our uh, intervention programs later on in the year so we could actually sit down and talk to parents about, not that this is a foolproof method, but there's a possibility by looking at the data that this might happen. And then um, I also talked to Becky, our guidance counselor, to get some input. So. I have, draft, I have drafted a letter, which Barb and Angela have, um, 
with the help of all, all of these other people. And um, what our plan is, is to <coughs> give the criteria out to parents at our parent-teacher conferences coming up here next, next week. Um, so they have an understanding of what that looks like and then start to, to talk to those parents that maybe have students that might be um, considered for that program. The last piece of our criteria is parent approval. Um, because I, I wouldn't want anyone's child to be in the program without their approval at the end saying, yes, this is what we want. <laughs> so um, we've put together some information and we'll be getting that out. Um, it really has to do with three things. The first is the academic pieces. And um, we, have a, we have an ADs assessment, which probably most people won't know what that's all about. But it is a preschool assessment um, in the preschool programs kind of giving, giving an academic assessment. Um, there's gold criteria, which encompasses all kinds of different things, um, physical, uh, social, <laughs> emotional, um, uh, academic. And we'll look at that, that information, and that will be part of and teacher recommendation from our preschool teachers will be another piece of this with that gold. And then finally, the parent um, um, approval. And that's kind of the process that we're looking at. Again, we're trying to keep those numbers um, so there's a, t a lower teacher to student ratio. Uh, we don't want to overload the program. Um, and again, it, if, if we have numbers that grow or something like that, that's something that I will come back and have to discuss with Barb and the board and say, okay, here's where we're at uh, yeah, at this point. But we're trying to keep them low. And um, one thing that one of our preschool teachers uh, mentioned to me is, you know, we always want to leave a spot or two open because in the past we've had some students that have come in that have had no preschool experience at all, none. And we kind of tried to steer the parents to our transitional kindergarten program because that was a great, a great start then, because then they'd have another opportunity. So um, I think that's probably it. And I think a question that I would ask, uh, because I get asked a lot, is uh, what about? I mean, we talk a lot about kids going from beginner garden or whatever that four-year-old program, you know, whatever you want to call that. From there to kindergarten um, for two years, we we have that conversation uh, with. I've had that conversation with parents, maybe not yeah. necessarily yeah. here, but uh, what, what do we tell those parents about that? Is 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 there anything to tell them about that? I mean, because there are going to be some kids who can't go from beginner garden to TK, yeah. and then to kindergarten. I mean, if the numbers um, get too high, you know, Chris, I would. What we're going to, what the plan is, and I went to Angela because we've had some conversations, and we, re, we have to follow the kindergarten Iowa core. That's, that's something we'll have to do in this, with, in this program. In the TK program. Yeah. It just may not go quite as quickly as a kindergarten program. Um, so I guess what I would say to those parents that are concerned at the end of kindergarten. <clears throat> There could always be some talk of, we'll try kindergarten for a second year. And that would not be new. Um, no. That's not a new situation. Mm -hmm. Having been a principal uh, not all that long ago, we would have kids, before we ever had transitional <laughs> kindergarten, we, have, we would have kids that would stay in kindergarten two years. And we might sense that by, you know, late the first se semester or into that second semester. And again, it would take parent permission to do that, but we might we, we might recommend a second year in kindergarten. And sometimes parents were wanting that to happen, and sometimes they work. So this just adds a little bit different element to it. Um, the one thing that we would want you to know, though, is that um, based on state law, between <coughs> kindergarten and third grade, there's one year that we can retain <coughs> kids. Okay, that's not our decision. Okay, that's that's a Department of Education translation of <coughs> legislation that we can retain one year. So if I have a student who is eligible for a transitional kindergarten 
and as a family we decide that he's going to be in transitional kindergarten, then there's no retaining between then and third grade. And that's not our decision. Okay. So the other piece of this that we want parents to understand is there's one time that you, you can retain one time. Now, if it gets to be second grade and we decide he needs to be retained, or she, okay, um, we can do it there if they've never been retained before. But if I, if I choose transitional kindergarten, then they're good to go from then to third grade. It's so right. so that counts. that's their retention yeah. year. That's and so what we want parents to understand is um, it's not to um, be negative about it, but it's to just say um, you've, used your, you've used your retention year. Okay. And two years of kindergarten would be the same exact thing. Two right? years of kindergarten okay. would be exactly the thing, same thing. And so for the board to understand that, that might even help in some conversations if people are asking you questions about it. And please be sure that you understand that's not an ESAC County Schools um, regulation or decision or board policy, but that's <coughs> part of what has been legislated <coughs> in the early you've got to be on grade letters, level so. by third grade. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what happens if if they went to TK and something, they just find them just isn't there for that school. Well, how does they stay in school, but they continue through the grades. And what happens at the end of third grade if they've not met, if they're not on level for third grade is there's mandatory summer school. And again, that's not, that's, and, that's yeah, what happened. What happens in that legislation in third grade, if you haven't been retained, you have the choice and this is legislation, this isn't, and they may meet, this This begins in 17, so they <coughs> may meet with some resistance yet before this is all said and done, but the way it sits right now is they would have the opportunity, I, you know, I would have the opportunity as a parent to say, I would rather retain my kid than send them to summer school. But if I've used up my retention year, then I have to send them to summer school. And we have to determine that at choice. the end of that summer school, if they've met the um, grade level expect expectations, and can they go on to fourth grade, or I don't even know what all of the options are, and I'm not sure those are crystal clear. Like Mike said, there'll be a fair amount of opposition to the, there already is, but there'll be a fair amount of it as it gets closer, because there's this business of the <coughs> legislature legislating um, about kids and when they can be retained and when they can and um, can they go on to fourth grade then? And, and it's all about getting kids by third grade to be on grade level for math and reading. I mean, and we understand that. But um, it, we'll, we'll see what happens. That's a, a few years away. But we have to be pretty um, transparent about this right now as that as the kids that are in transitional kindergarten will be part of that group of kids as they move along to third grade now. So we have no problem having the program that can operate with Iowa Core. Um, we talked with Angela about that. It just won't be as deep um, or to the extent that kindergarten would be, so we have no problem with that. We really will we'll start to hold to lower numbers because if these kiddos need assistance of any kind, they need a classroom setting that has fewer kids. It can't end up that there are 22 kids in transitional kindergarten or the purpose of the program sort of floats away, you know, with that many kids in the program. So, And Chris, I, I have had parents ask, rather than take, rather than have my child in this program, would you consider if I wanted them to stay in kindergarten a second year, would that be okay? And it, we've done that with some. So that door doesn't close or anything for that. So that might help. I, just, I think it's going to help a lot just us having this conversation and saying that we are going to have a teacher next year. I think uh, something that we could run into, though, is, you know, um, let's say we've got 17 kids through whatever process you go through, and we've got somebody who says, you know, I just, my kid's smart enough to move on, but I just want to hold him or her back because of, of him or, or his or her age. Right. Yeah. You know, and uh, social, yeah. social social reasons, yeah. And I, I think we could run into just a little bit of opposition there, but I think it's going to help a lot just to say that we are going to have the program. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think the criteria that we've set up are legitimate, and they look at the whole child. You know, so we're not just saying well, it's going to be determined by their age only. Or so there's several kinds of criteria that. Uh, We'll, we'll take a look at, to look at all around the child, you know, what what does that child look like in, in cooperation with the parents. Then. Yeah, I so also agree. Mm -hmm. No, I just, 
I want it to be a parent's choice when it comes down to the end, you know, yes. yep. if they don't feel their child's ready to go to kindergarten, whether the numbers dictate that or not, you know. What happens when you get up to 18? Do we start telling them no? Because how do you still let that happen? Um, it's going to be below 18, first of all. <laughs> right, but what if, I mean, what if you then we have to talk about whether we have enough, then we have to look at are there enough students for two sections of okay. 2K and maybe... I shouldn't say this since it's being recorded. <laughs> Two sections well, of you know, TK and one section of kindergarten. Or we had this discussion about a year ago, or March, yeah, whether we were going to have six, mm -hmm. five, six teachers, you know, in the lower two. So I think, you know, I think we could, not to interrupt you, Lisa, but I think we could sit here and say what if, what if, what if, yeah. all, all night long. But I think what we need to make sure is that we are going to have the program. And that exactly. you know, if, yeah. if it does get to to the point where we we'll have too many, to we, need numbers to, when my, you know, <coughs> we need to make sure that we work that those sections out uh, logically. You know, because I, I mean, yeah. you can understand you don't need 22, no. 22 kids in a classroom. That are, <coughs> and Angela does a great job. Uh, she's got what do you have? Eighteen kids this year. I got sixteen right now. Sixteen we this year. Some moved out and some moved in. And you have you have some challenges, but. You know, uh, I mean, I have a daughter in that class, and, and she loves to go to school. She learns a lot, so I think it's a great program. I, I think, you know, we'll not necessarily not worry about the numbers tonight, but we can say what if all night long. Uh, Actually, tonight we're not worried about the numbers. Okay, so we're not going to worry about the numbers tonight. <laughs> oh, but I, I'm just happy that we're going to have the program and, and yeah. that, you know, we yeah, are going to. Yeah, I think a lot, yeah. <clears throat> We're going to continue that. So, um, second, Mike, thank you. Sorry. No, that's okay. No, second no, thing no. on the reports list is the current school calendar and makeup days. Um, and this is just to keep you informed about where we're at with things. Um, we are going to be using March 2nd and March 23rd, which were um, originally scheduled as PD days as um, makeup days. And I want to explain, I think I did this at the last board meeting, but I want to explain again to you so that it's clear. Um, we are choosing to make up school days um, before seniors leave the district. Um, the state guidance on the state law, not just guidance, but the state law about seniors is that um, they can miss up to five days. Um, their school year can be five days shorter than the regular school year. So our school year ends for the rest of our students on the 21st. Uh, students are scheduled for the 14th, and then graduation right after that. Um, especially with Kevin, I've had conversations about, so what do you think the success would be of bringing seniors back after graduation? And we were pretty certain we knew the answer to that. Um, and we were going to need to do things like hang on to their diplomas or whatever, which seemed like bad ideas. So because we had professional development days built in, we had places to be able to, to make those up so that seniors are making those days up. So if starting today, and I hate to even say this because it'll probably be a blizzard next week, but if, if our calendar from today to the end of the year as it's currently scheduled would play out and we have no additional days missed because of weather, our seniors would have missed five fewer days than the rest of our students. Our students will uh, have their last day on the 21st. And we will be within half a dozen hours of the planned school calendar. The second piece of what you need to know is the state law says, because we've chosen hours, that we need to have at least 1,080 hours. Our calendar was built on the calendar that you approved uh, last year without parent-teacher conferences. Um, was scheduled to be 1,120 hours. So really what we've said to the Department of Education is we're not only going to have students 1,080 hours, we've said we're going to have students 1,120 hours. Okay? And... The calendar as it's currently scheduled, again, if we had every day of school that were currently scheduled, we would be within three or four hours of what our original calendar date and number of hours were, were actually required by law to meet the 11, 20, or as close to it as we can. We report in best documents to the Department of Ed what our calendar dates are, and we'll need to report how close to the end of that calendar we've gotten and then how close seniors were to that as well. Well, and those are a little bit new as far as reporting is concerned. So uh, when the law changed to hours or days, then there's some additional reporting. So now they're just watching a whole lot closer about whether schools are actually doing what they're saying 
we're doing. So someone said to you, well, you only need to do 1,080 hours. Why are we doing these extra hours? That's what was planned in the calendar. Most schools who choose hours have, have more than the 1,080 for a lot of reasons. Some of them because they might need them as makeup time. But the other piece of that is we, we <coughs> out here in rural Iowa especially have always had a longer school day. We've had the same number of days in the year, but we've always had a longer <coughs> school day than urban schools have anyway. So it's not unusual for us to have more than what's required. Um, this was called a 170-day calendar, um, the calendar that you approved last year. But the 170 days aren't so important. It's the 1,080 hours um, that are the important piece for us. And then add to that, our calendar said 1,120. So we're going to be where we need to be with that. Here's what does happen, though, as far as teacher contract is concerned. Teachers are on contract for 185 days. And when we get to the end of our student days, there's a planned uh, teacher work day, and then there are two professional development days. If you go back to the original printed calendar, um, when we get there, teachers will have worked 180 days. What's happened is we've taken those professional <coughs> development days and used them as student days, and those have just kind of been pushed toward the end of the year then. So once students are out, teachers will have either seven or eight professional development days at the end of the year. Okay. So those will be made up? And they will be made, made up. up. Yeah. Made we'll up. treat them like we would There's any other work day for the them if they've got a dentist appointment or if they're ill or if it's personal leave or whatever. But our plan will be to use part of those as all district for all of our staff, all of our teachers, teaching staff, PD, and then we'll have some that's split between elementary and middle school, high school. <coughs> so that's to just let you know that um, I think it's... Um, like the 27th or the 28th of May. I should have had that right in front of me. It is um, on May 28th would have been the end of the 185 day calendar for teachers. It will now be five days longer than that. We'll complete that calendar by June 30th. Um, if we do 80 faculty members all at once for some professional development, obviously then um, all teachers will be there. Elementary might not necessarily schedule some of their professional development days and the rest of those the same days as middle school, high school. So we'll have those finished by the end of the, by June 30th. Teachers will work 185 days. I mean, believe me, we have plenty that we can do in professional development, so that's not a worry for us about what we'll do. But I just wanted to make sure you understood you know, what that calendar situation was and how it looks and why we've been trying to really hold tight to keep seniors in school on the makeup days. Do you have any questions? Anyone out there have any questions about it? Actually, I do. Uh, what would you say the two days were, March 23rd and... I think it's the 2nd and the 23rd of March. March. Yep. Um, calendar for next year. Um, have had done nothing. No one has planned anything yet. So... Um, the legislators are still talking and sort of haggling over it. So I, I have no idea. Last week we heard it might be a August 23rd. Everyone in the whole state of Iowa State started on the same day. Um, we've also known that the Department of Ed uh, read the rules and just said it says that there are no waivers unless X happens and you'll start the week of September 1st, that, that the day of September falls and September 1st falls. And we don't know what that is. And if we start a calendar now, it might change three times before the, you know, I's are dotted and T's are crossed on that. So honestly, we're just not starting that calendar, which is a little unnerving to parents of uh, seniors for next year who are wondering about graduation and being able to make some reservations for things. And it's like, um, we, we understand that, but there's really no reason to start a calendar yet. So um, that's the update on calendar. Um, the last thing, quickly, is attendance center rankings. Uh, two years ago, in the 2013 legislative session, the legislature passed um, a law that said um, that, well, that there would be rankings of every attendance center in Iowa. There are over 1,300 attendance centers. Um, we have four. 
a high school, a middle school, and two elementary schools. Our alternative school is considered part of our high school. <coughs> so I've counted every attendance center in Iowa. There are over 1,500 of them. Um, honestly, I'm not exactly sure what their thinking was about why we needed them. Um, some of the guidance on it uh, is that other states do this, so Iowa probably should do it. Um, there is a short little blurb on the front page of our website. It's about two or three sentences long. There's a link there with a letter attached to it um, <coughs> that describes how you can get to the current attendance center rankings. Um, there are nine criteria that will be used. Right now there are two that are published, and no school is ranked at this time, but they will be in a couple of months. So before school is out, every attendance center in Iowa will be ranked. And the ranking will be based on growth um, and proficiency. And uh, there's some explanation in the letter that's um, in the link on our website about what growth and proficiency mean. And you can take a look at those. You can um, click on that link. You can find ESAC County. It's a drop-down box. Um, you can take a look at any one of our attendance centers, or you can take a look at our district as a whole, and you can compare uh, districts in the area or schools where your um, nieces and nephews go to school compared to us. Um, and know that right now there's no ranking system, but in about 60 days there will be. And I'll let you know um, when that's available, what it looks like. And when we get to that point, I'll actually bring it to you and show you um, what that attendance center ranking system looks like. So um, over the next year and a half, the other seven criteria will be uh, Will, will be determined in some sort of numerical or statistical um, means so that uh, things like parent participation in school can be a statistics, a uh, statistic, a number, and then we can have that as a piece of what the rankings are related to. Um, but it is what it is, and um, it will be out soon, and you can get a feel for it if you take a look again. Front page, it's in red, there's a little attendance center rankings title, and then there's two or three sentences with a link. Click on that, takes you to a letter, and then click inside there. There's another live link, and you can get to the attendance center rankings as they currently are. So, um, we'll see how that feels across Iowa and Hennis. And it will be a mix of middle school, high school, elementary schools um, ranked against each other. So. <coughs> Questions about that or comments? I think we could all make some comments about it. Some of us have. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, so, Jeff, you mentioned that there's some other schools that do this. Uh, are there any other schools that do this in the area? Yeah, so I know that there's one in Des Moines that does it. Uh, there's one in Des Moines that does it. 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 There's one in Des end of the uh, board meeting. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about it right now, and then if John makes it back, he's at a wrestling meeting right now, if he makes it back, we'll give him the opportunity to, to speak if, if that's what he wants to do. Um, so I want to start this, this discussion out by apologizing to everybody here who thinks that I wanted to close the program down. Um, I don't know how that got messed up, but uh, at the last board meeting, John, John and I got into a discussion about uh, spending money on facilities, and I thought, you know, there's no reason for us to spend any money on facilities for a program who that hasn't had a good attendance. And so, uh, you know, somehow that got blown out of proportion, and, and uh, people thought that I wanted to shut the program down. That's not what I want to do. Uh, I would like to see us have a lot more kids go out, uh, but there's not a lot I can do about that. Um, so uh, I think what we need to do, uh, I will give anybody here an opportunity to talk, but um, you know, obviously uh, we're not going to, we can't do anything about the program tonight, whether we're going to, whether we're going to have it or not, because this is only a discussion item. Um, and I mean, we're just we're not going to talk about he said she said we're not going to do any of that if you guys have something that you want to say uh, about the wrestling program uh, we'll listen to that if we get into some discussion that 
uh, shouldn't be discussed. We, I mean, we can't discuss anything about uh, the kids that are out. We can't discuss anything about uh, the faculty or, or coaches or anything like that. So uh, if anybody had, wants to say anything, if any <coughs> the board members want to say anything, uh, go ahead. I did talk to the rec center, and we were kind of up there since they've removed some bleachers on both sides. Um, I believe that it would be uh, it would be a code to have a dual meet there. We currently have mats there. I Is mean, there they wrestling have that goes on there now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Practice. So, which would then have, we would have plenty of locker room space for visiting towns. So. So that's an option. And they were definitely open to having that. I mean, we, yeah, the rec center itself has concessions, so whether we put that out with another group or whatever, but <coughs> yeah, for, and for right now, use that. for right now, the wrestling meets are going to be housed in Lake View for next year, and we, we made that decision at the last board meeting. So, mm -hmm. um, but that is that is a good option. So. What is the floor space on? On the, for that rec center gym, because we're going to have a double duel there, that we could run into the same problems. Yeah, because uh, <coughs> you're going to put two mats there. You got you have to have, make sure you're not wall to wall, or you still yeah, can follow. Yeah, because it's what ten feet. It's got to be ten feet to the, to the bleachers from the end of the mat, and then it's got to be five feet. You got to make sure you have your five feet mat safety space from the end of the circle to the end of the mat. It has to be five feet of, and that's where Bestie's been. Adamant that that has to be followed. Okay, can you give me those dimensions real quick? Because I go there a lot. But I, from what we kind of, did, it wasn't. It won't work. So you you don't have enough parking space. You don't have enough bleacher space. It's not you won't have near enough parking or space for all the people. Because if you've gone to all so to a meet, you'll see that the visitor side is mm -hmm. pretty close to full, and they spill over to the home side, and those are. Pretty cool. There's not near enough bleacher space at the rec center for it to be sufficient. Then you have to think where the buses are going to park and mm -hmm. parking. There's absolutely no parking. It would it would not work. Okay, so I you know I think this is a great conversation, but I don't think this is a conversation that we need to have in this board meeting tonight. Um, I mean, we can, we can discuss the rec center at another time, but uh, like I said, for now, next year, obviously. Uh, Unless it changes, but for next year it's going to be in Lake View, and so if we want to bring up the rec center again, we can do that at, a, at another time. I mean, we don't have any, we don't have any measurements, and we don't have any uh, uh, other information. So I think that that's a discussion that we should have at a different time. So does anybody else have anything that they want to say? I do, as a parent that has a son. <laughs> And excuse me if I get emotional, but that's just who I am. <laughs> um, and I wrote my, I just wrote it down because I want to, I don't want to let my brain get ahead of my mouth. Um, wrestling is a hard sport. To compete at the sport means hours spent in a hot wrestling room, sweating, running, and building strength. It means hours spent lifting weights and doing push ups and sit ups. Wrestlers have to watch what they eat to maintain weight or to make weight. Then, after hours of practice, they get six minutes on the mat to prove if their hard work paid off against one opponent. Sometimes you are the victor, and sometimes you weren't fast enough or strong enough, and you go back to the wrestling room to train harder. But it is a beautiful sport, too. It teaches an athlete that hard work and dedication do pay off. It teaches you how to be a gracious winner, but also a gracious loser. It teaches the athlete to set goals and to work towards those goals, whether it is making a certain weight, beating a certain opponent, or making that medal stand in a tournament or at state. Wrestling is hard, so not very many do it, but my son does. Most successful programs in the area have a youth program or feeder program. Tyson Veit and John Hemer have started to build a youth program. This year they had about 60 kids. I was at a recent tournament in Rockwell City where we had 15 or 20 young wrestlers competed and they did quite well. We had three middle school wrestlers advanced to AAU State last weekend. There is a future coming. Right now, ESAC does not have a strong history in the sport of wrestling and the sport does not get much support or participation. I would like to commend John Smith for trying to build a program. I hear stories of him cruising the lunchroom at the high school and middle school trying to convince kids to give it a try. But even for all his efforts, the program continues to flounder. Um, as Chris reads our mission statement, there's another part to that mission statement that says, we live this mission by focusing decisions and planning on what appears to be two very simple, straightforward questions. 
Is this in the best interest of our students? And will this help our students learn and grow? And know that I was in the group that designed that mission statement. And as a staff member at ESAC, I tried very hard to live that mission statement in my classroom. All I'm asking is that we as a district live that mission statement in wrestling as well. Is a program where three or four wrestlers are on a team where we have difficulty getting teams to wrestle against us, where the athletes struggle to improve skills and grow in the sport in the best interest of our kids? I've heard stories where there's only one wrestler at practice. In order to become better at wrestling, you have to have someone to practice with. You have to learn the, the moves and have someone teach you moves and counter moves. I've heard that there are some more boys that are interested in going out. I'm hoping that we can have a program that will build, and I read an article about Trainer Iowa where, similar to ours, didn't have much of a program, brought in some new staff, and, and now it's thriving and the boys are winning more. This is what I'm hoping for East Sac. Keeping a current program as is because a few people want to wrestle, I don't believe is the best interest. Providing a program where kids want to be there, where they can grow in their skills, where they can feel proud of their accomplishments and then walk off the mat is in their best interest. I don't think our current program provides that. Not sure what the reason is. Might be coaching staff, might be we just don't have enough interest. But I would ask that you consider making changes so that my son and some others with him that want to compete have a chance. We've made policies and decisions before, and those were in programs that had successful and adequate participation. We're just asking that wrestling gets the same consideration to become more of a competitive sport. Thank you for reading that, Sandy. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure what to take out of it, though. I mean, you said an awful lot of things in there. Some of them I don't quite understand. Um, I think that we're trying to build a, the part where she said that, we, um, that it's kind of up and coming, that we have, have how many? 60 in our youth program? How can we support that? Can we? What can we do? You said it before about, um, you know, it's going to take a bit, how many years to really establish because we've been, this has been a, an ongoing battle since you were in high school, but wrestling just wasn't something. So what can we do to get behind a sport that can be really successful and really can do a lot for the students? What can we do as a district to help support that? I mean, I think the best thing that we can do is offer the programs that we're offering. But here's one of the problems. We have Tyson Wright and John Huma, who also have young kids. You know, so they can't spend as much time as they probably would like to, uh, or they did when they were younger, when they were wrestling. Um, I mean, it, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of volunteers. And... For me to sit here and say that I know how to, I know how to fix that, I can't do it. I think the main thing is support, is because you, you hear a lot of people like they have to make way. There's a, there's so, there's so many uneducated people with making weight. They think, oh, you have to cut five pounds. You can't eat. You can't drink. That's not the case. The case is you you have to maintain. You have to have discipline, and you you get down to gradually. There's a there's a law man there's a law mandating how much weight you can lose a week. You can't just lose 10 pounds in a day. And these kids put, the kids that are out, do put a lot of work in, and they, other kids don't want to put that much work in. They, the kids in the weight room that watch, that don't, that see how much work's going into it, they don't want to put that work into it. They understand that if I go out for wrestling, I'm going to have to dedicate myself to it. And a lot of people aren't. And I don't think you can make a kid. You know, you can't, the kid has to want to do it. And with the, and with the up and coming, the kids come up and coming, Tyson, and John and, and Brian Ashinger are doing a great job down there. They have a lot of volunteers, a lot of a lot of kids. They're very excited. It's, when you go there on a Tuesday night, you, you have fun watching. I know that John and Ben are over at Burnside with the junior high, which that's why I was earlier. And I give great credit to John for saving the wrestling, essentially, when the previous coach stepped down. There wasn't a serious search to find a coach. Wrestling was pretty much going to let to go away. And John took over and stepped up and took it, knowing John's never wrestled. He doesn't have much experience with coaching. What he knows, he's learned over the last couple of years. But there's, we all want the same thing as parents of these kids that are wrestling. We want a competitive program. It's not enough to say we have wrestling. And that's the attitude that's in this community. There's no way that the football program, the basketball program, would be allowed to have gone down 
to the point where wrestling is right now. They would not allow them to be non-competitive. I speak to all the coaches in the other districts on that. There's no fear to wrestling us. And wrestling is one of those big <coughs> sports there is. It takes serious, serious intestinal fortitude to go out on a map for six minutes by yourself with no one else. My son's been doing it for ten years. I mean, there's other kids below him that are giving it the same. I mean, it's, I give John great credit, and I don't like the bad mouthing. And I always give credit when I speak about him that he's what he's done, and he's not here to defend himself. But the simple fact is, I've spoke to eighth graders, freshmen, sophomores, juniors. There are other kids that would love to go off for wrestling, but his personality has pushed them away. All right, that's and I, 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 I say that there are kids there. There's, there's interest at the lower level. We don't want to hear it anymore. No, that's fine. I'm not going to say anymore about it. Anymore, but, but the fact is, we need to have a competitive program. Because I, as a parent and other parents, we shouldn't have to make the decision for our children that they have to decide to think about open enrollment to have an opportunity to be successful. When they've been with all their classmates since the beginning, okay. that shouldn't be. Well, that's enough. You can sit down now. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to say? They do have 14 junior high wrestlers this year. Um, I think they just added another one this week. And I also think um, that putting the wrestling um, matches and the meets themselves in like you in the bigger gym, the opening, I don't know, it just seems like it's a little bit more welcoming to other teams. I think it gives um, some kind of, I don't even know what the word, just it looks better feels better, um, I think just to give it a little more visuality to the school maybe will help. So I know we appreciate that that's going to take place next year, and I'm not, I guess I'm just not sure why we're still looking for another place when that one seems to fit all of the criteria. So maybe you could answer that. I don't know why we're I still looking since that, I mean, you it was, see what's it was just an option. I didn't know a whole lot about it. I was, it was just out okay. of trying to find ways to help. I mean, <laughs> sure. the mats I, were there. I saw I Ben and John both there at the last board meeting that mm -hmm. I was at for the Rec Center board. And we're always, as, as a board member of the Rec Center as well, we're always looking for ways to get people in there. And if they offered that for free and, and it was easier, then we talked about putting it in the gym and what that was going to take. And if we really wanted to do that, to have to do it the night before and tape the mats down and whatever. So it was, it was just an option. It was just, so. Okay. Thank you. I know, we, I know we were stated that, that we weren't, that we weren't going to attack faculty or, and we, I need, I'd like to know that on the record that that wasn't supposed to be, that wasn't supposed to happen today. And the guy that's not defending, that's not here to even defend himself is getting talked about in a meeting that we're not supposed to talk about faculty. <clears throat> Or, or wrestlers or anything else like that. We're supposed to talk about the program as a whole. Right. That's why I'd like to just just be on the record. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, does anybody else have anything else to say? I do. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, as a former wrestler, you know, uh, graduated in 2011, so I'm not too far of the program to kind of see what's going on. And uh, I'm out a lot talking to people, and one thing that ever gets brought up is and how competitive are we and how productive are we. And the one thing I always like to bring up is, you know, there's never been uh, a real good basis like there is to be now. So, you know, I never did it as a kid when I was a sophomore. Wasn't very good, didn't understand the sport, to run with 60 wins. I, a teammate went out as a sophomore, ended up making the state. Another teammate when I was a sophomore, went, went out in 50 matches in like two years. This is what we're, I see that in that rapid growth in two to three years for all these guys. And now I see young kids being motivated and wanting to go out. You know, 14 kids on a junior high team. 14 kids, that's a complete team with some extras. And you can put a team together and be really, really competitive. So now we have a trend of rapid growth and getting very competitive very fast in a short time with kids that are going to be there at a young age to be able to start and be able to grow. And I think it's, it's great to see that. And then once you know the program and know the kids and know the success that they've had in these short <coughs> bursts, it really shows the potential to be very competitive and very good to watch. It's just, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation that people might know, not know. And they just read the paper 
you know, just don't actually know the program. But once someone explains it to them, you kind of see, you know, I, I see where you're coming from. You know, maybe you're right. Maybe I should go watch a match, you know, and see these younger kids kind of progress as athletes and as people. Yeah, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody coming here and everybody talking about the program. I mean, honestly, guys, we're, we're talking about something that could be talked about out on the street. You guys could be discussing this among yourselves. We don't need to, we don't need to be saying this stuff in a board meeting. I mean, and obviously it's getting a little out of hand in places. Um, so, I mean, unless you have, a, uh, unless somebody has some way that we can make the program uh, better, which I don't understand. I mean, I don't understand how you can do that. You can't just say, yep, we're going to make it better because the kids have to want to go out. You can't make a kid go out for wrestling. Obviously, it's a very difficult sport. There's just two people out on the mat. You don't have a buddy to pass the ball to. So we're not going to we're not going to uh, discontinue the program. We're going to continue to have the program. Uh, and it, I mean, like I said, we we can't talk about staff. We can't talk about the kids. So. Uh, I got a couple of things I could say. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but yeah. um, you talk about support, uh, what, what, the, what the school board can do. Um, you know, obviously we can't make a kid cut weight. We can't do it. Um, but there are things maybe we can do. We, we changed the location for legal reasons. It's going to happen next year. Staffing, um, I'm not going to talk about specific staff, but um, if we're worried about the program going away or something. The school has thrown money at problems before, issues before. If you want to hire another staff for a year or two to see if it works, to see what this wrestling position or what this wrestling tradition can start as or be, um, I would be afraid of spending a little bit more money on staffing. Whatever that would look like, I don't have an idea, but I'm just saying I, maybe another coach or something. Um, we could do something. As a board, you, you start talking about um, maybe a slippery slope, but free attendance for meets, uh, maybe free concessions for some meets, things like that that we could try to get some uh, people involved in the community other than just parents. I mean, those are things that probably the board can okay. I'm not saying we're going to okay them tonight because we can't, but it's ideas that I don't want to sit back and say, uh, don't want the rest of the thing to happen, or the tradition hasn't really even started yet, I guess, in my opinion. We need to start something new if that's what you guys want. Um, I'd like to try a little bit more before it goes by the wayside or people act like the board didn't try. Uh, those are just a couple ideas I came up with to think about this. So um, I'm going to have to talk about them forever. Um, the location's already been decided for next year. Staffing would be an issue as far as hiring another coach as an idea or an additional coach. Um, the other things is free attendance and concessions. Those are just things to get people in the, you know, get grandparents there because they're <coughs> just ideas that we as a board could probably do something about. I think those are good ideas. Um, and there's probably a lot more, but I'm just saying uh, it's got to start somewhere. Not that it hasn't been here before, but um, we, we could look at those things. I don't know enough about wrestling to, to take my extra time and go out and try to figure out ways. I have all girls, you know what I mean? So I guess my thing, you say that we can't sit here and and go over all of this. We could talk about this out on the street, is right. Um, I would say for parents and wrestlers to, to bring something to the board that we can vote on, to, you know, to, to get together, come up with some ideas for us and bring that. Um, so that we're not just doing this, because I certainly don't want to see it go, and I would love, I would definitely entertain, you know, ideas. I came from, I'm old, okay, <laughs> so we'll just acknowledge that first, but I came from a high school that had a wrestling tradition and still does in northeastern Iowa, and when people have talked about, you know, but we wouldn't let football fall apart, or we wouldn't let basketball fall apart, and I was trying to sit there thinking, uh, but what would we ever do to um, push it or to inspire it or whatever? And then trying to think back to the high school that I came from, who still has a strong wrestling tradition. Um, and I, 
I enjoy wrestling meets because I grew up with a brother that was a wrestler and friends of mine in high school wrestled and I'm trying to think, so what was it about it that made it roll and keep going? And frankly, I think it happened so long before I was ever in high school that it just, there were just kids that said, I'm not playing basketball, I'm going to be a wrestler. And uh, we've got to get ourselves, it's almost like we've got to climb the mountain to get to that point where it can kind of sustain itself. Um, and I don't know what that is. I also think I remember that quite a long time ago, and it might have been just while I the Auburn, that we had fairly um, good numbers of wrestlers. Because I remember my husband and I going to wrestling meets at Wall Lake. And they're doing the late. We did when, like when your boys what, were yeah, in, in high mean. school. And I think there, it felt at that time like it had some momentum going. And then, just like other things, classes that kids take during the school day that are electives, how do, how do we ever figure out what they take and what they don't take? But um, I don't know that I have any suggestions. Um, Brett's ideas are probably as, as good as we're going to hear tonight about things that we can do. You know, we're not in a position to sponsor the little kids wrestling program. But whatever we're not doing that it would take to keep these middle school kids out, because actually, Connie, I thought there were 15 kids out. So maybe the numbers will get bigger through the night here. But <coughs> if we can get those 15 kids to stay in and wrestle, yeah. In the whole team. Yeah. In summer seventh grade, you know. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, and the other piece of maybe, and it's not speaking, it's just saying maybe we do need more help and maybe we need that variety of personalities. I, I don't know what it is, but um, I, I, do, I do think it's hard to get going and um, I think it kind of maintains itself in that, in that tradition. But, but, but I would add something that, that's an encouraging sign. Um, Having grown up also in a wrestling community, um, and, and what, what does it take to build a program? Um, Marion gets credit for going out as a sophomore. Hum wrestling is probably one of the most humbling sports except it's mano y mano. And it has to start, I mean, there's a good sign where I hear 60 young kids are starting wrestling. That's really where <coughs> programs are built. Um, you talk to any guys that wrestle at high school, or you talk to a guy that wrestled at the University of Iowa, where did it start? I was this tall when I ended on the mat. You know? And I think when you've got uh, some passionate parents, and it sounds like um, Tyson Knight and John Heumann are, are passionate about it, that's where you start building your ranks uh, and getting those young kids exposed to it. Because, like I said, once, once kids get exposed to it, now they've gotten out of, yes, this is a sport for me, or no, it's not a sport for me. You know, and I think that's where you start building. It's encouraging to hear that we've got 60 young kids um, willing to give, willing to give this sport, which is a very demanding sport, um, a try. And I think that's that's where you continue to kind of push those younger ranks. Then they'll work themselves. You're going to lose kids. I mean, I don't care what sport it is, be it you know basketball, football, and those little rank every goes out for everything. You know, but then they kind of weed themselves out as they move their way from middle school to high school. You're going to lose some. But you're always trying to encourage, you know, 15 kids at the middle school ranks in seventh and eighth grade. That's the start. But really, 60 kids are where you want to hone your hone your your time and your efforts on. We're also three years removed from having four district qualifiers and one state qualifier, which is the best that East Sac has done in a long, long time. And we, we've had a rough couple of years, but there, there has been success, and there will be success again. It just we're not go it's like there hasn't been any success whatsoever that we've had state qualifiers we've had state place winners we've had district qualifiers it's just it, there is there has been success it's not like we're building from from nothing you're the assistant coach right co-head coach co-head coach. Co coach or assistant whatever you want would, yeah <laughs> uh, would coach would Allen. another uh, uh coach Allen. Yeah. coach yeah <laughs> uh would another Staff member help? Do you think? Or I don't. I'd have to talk with John, but I. I don't know if it could hurt or not, but I. I but I, I. don't think that's the the main problem. Is the problem is the numbers. If we could have someone that's in school, on our staff, that would be great because they could talk to kids constantly, be, and tell them, hey, you should be out for wrestling. That someone you see every day, that you have to go to their class and everything else, that could help them. It goes back to you can't make a kid go no. out. I mean, uh, no. And. Okay, guys, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to cut this short. I have a quick suggestion. I asked last year 
Mr. Olhausen and directed me to Telly. You know, it's too late this year to make it happen, but I asked last year why is there not a home junior high meet? There wasn't one last year, the one wasn't this year. There hasn't been in the past. I mean, majority of your kids in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, their version and their interpretation of wrestling is a chair and jumping off a rope or what you see on Friday night on TV, it's not folk style wrestling. I mean, I think a lot of, if we were to have a home meet and encourage the kids in the junior high, even the sixth grade, fifth grade, come watch, come see a meet. I mean, a lot of kids, if they see folk style wrestling, they're going to think, I can do that. I, I mean, wrestling great. girls by exposure, it's too late this year, maybe it's a possibility next year, maybe schedule the meet the day after the high school meet, so the mats are already in place, there's no having to reset them up twice. I mean, it would, it would take some work to get it done next year, and maybe not even next year, but for it to grow, it has to be exposed. I mean, the rule of thumb, they say, is that once a kid gets past fourth grade, fifth grade, they get to basketball age, they go towards the easier sport. Because the former superintendent for Odebo, OEBCIG, she asked me, how can we get our middle school numbers to grow? And my answer to her was, how are your basketball numbers? She goes, they're very high. I said, they're always going to be higher than that, your wrestling numbers. I says, because once they hit the age where they can go choose the sport, they tend to go to the one that's a little easier. But I think if we were to have a home junior high meet, it would expose the kids and maybe put it on the announcement that, hey, come see the wrestling. Let kids see it and be exposed to it. I think it would help grow the numbers. And the youth program, what's going on, you're, we're not going to see anything from that for four to five years for them to when they roll into the high school. But there are, is interest at the lower level. <coughs> if we were to get interest and exposure to the junior high, it would help. And those are the numbers that we're talking about. That we want 14, to grow. 15 that we want to grow and at least maintain that. I think that that's a great idea. I think exposure is is part of it. If, I think if it was here, I would go. I mean, <coughs> at Burnside tonight, there's 102 matches. Do we host any, and I know this isn't within the district, but do we host any youth tournaments? No. Like the little kids? No, no. Anywhere near here? Rockwell, or the closest. So when, that, you know, first place. A few years ago, before there was Mr. Hamer and Mr. Byte, um, John did hold tournaments for all the little kids. He's the one, really, that started the little rep, the little rugrats, or whatever you want to call them. And they they um, they had a great turnout for that, and they did that in Wall Lake also. They had little tournaments for at the end of the um, season, so to speak, for the little ones. That could still be done this year to expose kids. I would think, because I think they're still in practice, are they not? Uh, I think they were done last year. Okay. We can go more. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. My name is Mark Couple. I'm pretty new to the Sac City area. We've been here for about five years. I've got about 40 plus years in the wrestling community as a coach, as a wrestler, and then one I've seen good programs, I've seen bad programs go from where we're at up to successful. We're doing the right thing as far as good. I'm glad, first thing I want to say, I'm glad the kids are not going to get rid of wrestling for them. That's probably why I'm here, the real reason we're here tonight. But when we hit the middle school area and the high school area, it becomes more involvement than just this coach or the other coach. It's got to be your football coach. It's got to be your basketball coach. It's got to be your gym teachers. Because that all everything you learn in wrestling transforms over to those other sports. I've never seen a successful wrestling program that didn't have a football coach say, hey, lineman, you need to go learn how to wrestle. Never seen one. I've been to the middle school program here. I've, I've helped out with the middle school program over here at the rec center. Your wrestling mats over there are, are bad. Uh, I know they said they've got some. I've heard rumors they're going to move some from somewhere else. you got a safety issue with those wrestling mats. So the money, if you put money um, into mats and whatnot, that might be the case. That's something that you can do over time. It's a long-term concern. You need to augment your coaching staff, whether it be through volunteer at the middle school and the high school. You know, I'm not saying you need to change anything, but you need to augment it. Meaning that you've got to bring in somebody who's got a history in wrestling, a background, and knows how to relay that to the kids. Because there's nothing more contagious than winning. Winning is the only thing that makes winning happen. If I come to a wrestling meet and all I see is four kids standing out there and I know we can't make them go out, I got that. Nobody's going to go out there with them. So that football coach needs to send his lineman out there and say, give it a try. And you can't make the football coach do that either, but you can suggest it. Okay. 
as a community, we got to come together. You're exactly right. It's something we have to talk about on the street through whatever voice, voice social media, whatever. You got to get that word out. But you need to augment your coaches. You need to update some of your equipment. Okay, facilities are fine. Lake View is, is, is fine facility. It's much better than Wall Lake ever was. Um, you got to get some home meets because you got to get your exposure, and that's something that your uh, athletic director is going to have to take care of. But without the exposure, without the communication, talking, without a little bit of extra money being put in, <coughs> so coaches and equipment, we're going to be right back here asking when you're going to cancel our program. Okay. And I've got a young sixth grader who's one of those three that falls out of the state, and he's looking forward to it. He said, Dad, I don't want to go anywhere. I got up this morning and I said to my wife, I said, you know what, I don't think I'm going to go to that school meeting because I don't think it's going to do any good. And she related to me, she said, that my son said, if you don't go there tonight, I'm not going to have a program to wrestle in. So get in there. Well, I'm actually glad you came because what you just said right there was more information than everybody else. Not that what everybody else said was not good, but that was more information to me than what everybody else said. We should do this, we should do that. I like that. I really do. Thank you for saying that. And. No, honestly, guys, we could sit here again. We could sit here all night and talk about we should do this or we should do that. We need we need to discuss this stuff in the public. So, but one thing that I do want to say is this is great. This is the first step. We're talking about it. Okay, we need to talk about it. We need to get people involved. We need to we need to get coaches involved. We need to get volunteers involved. We need to get the kids involved. Okay, we can't do that by myself going up to a kid who I don't know and say, hey, you should go wrestle. He doesn't care what I say. You know, we need to get the parents involved. We need to get, that'll get the kids involved. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everybody, for offering your suggestions. Uh, you know, and I, I'm sure this is something that we'll continue to talk about as a board. So let's move on. Uh, new business. Discuss and or approve board policy 507.1. Student health and immunization certificates. Um, we had a copy of the board policy, and it's just a matter of language of changing licensed physician to licensed <clears throat> health care professional. Um, so it has nothing to do with our policy regarding immunization. It's simply that language has been brought by the, at the state level. So I'd ask for your approval of that change in policy. So moved. We've got a motion and a second to amend uh, board policy. 507.1 as stated. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Uh, new business uh, 7B <coughs> discuss proposed budget. John, you want to? Yep, I got that. Talk about that. Our budget's due April 15th, so by April 14th we need to have our public hearing and our meeting for approval. Um, I've kind of got it boiled down to, been through a couple drafts of the budget, and through all that you finally end up with only five or six decisions the board really gets to make. So um, let's hit those real quick, they shouldn't take long, and then you can give me some direction on where you want to go with those six decisions, um, what you want to use for a timeline uh, for getting this thing approved, and getting next year's budget on the road. So. Number one, Pepple Levy. Uh, we've had it at 33 cents, which is the maximum level for several years, uh, at least ever since we've been in Sac County. It generates about $120,000 per year to be used for physical plant and equipment, and I would recommend that uh, we leave that at that level. The management level, or levy for insurance, property and liability insurance, early retirement, unemployment insurance, workman's comp, primarily those things. Um, current year we have that at $300,000. It's generated through property tax, costs 82 cents per thousand, and we have an estimated expense next year of 250 dollars to $275,000. So I'd recommend that we leave that at $300,000 also. Has the property insurance been going up and down very much? I mean, health insurance is always an issue, but what's yeah. property insurance down? We're just seeing the steady increase, the 10 the 10 percent every year, or 8 percent. Yeah, that's a pretty big deal too. Isn't it? $100, but dollars but 90 percent of our increase is work comp, 
which goes right back into your health field, you know, because it's health related. So that's that's where your increase is. I'm not saying that's ninety percent of the premium, but that's what the increase is for this thing. Um, instructional support levy uh, that was passed by um, public vote a few years ago and maximum of 10% of the regular program cost generates about a half a million dollars for this school district. Uh, we fund it through a combination of property tax and income surtax. Current year, it's a 1% income surtax and the balance on property tax. If we would use that same ratio, um, it'd be $1.14 on your, on your tax rate. So, uh, The fourth item is allowable growth School Budget Review Committee, and there's two items that we brought to you over the course of the last few months. One was special ed deficit, and the second one was um, increased open enrollment. Uh, they both allow for um, additional budget room anytime you have those two items. For our district, those two things add up to $179,000. If we choose to fund those, we'll fund them with property tax, which is uh, right around 50 cents. Then in December, we approved the modified allowable growth for dropout prevention. It was $283,000. And if we fully implement that, that will cost us about $0.80 cents per thousand. Okay. Then uh, item number six is the cash reserve levy. And um, it's recommended by the state that a, a district would have on hand typically three months' worth of expenses. For our district, we spend seven or eight hundred thousand dollars a month. So, two point one to two point four million is what we should have on hand. Um, our fiscal year fourteen beginning balance was one point seven, so it was slightly below that. Now, that being said, um, our low balance since that point has been about four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. So, we haven't really came to a point where we were for fear of being out of cash to make payroll or, or pay bills. So, um, current year, this year, we have a $200,000 cash reserve levy. Um, my recommendation here is that we leave it at 150, and I guess that could really be open for discussion, depending on what you want to do with your, with your tax rate um, at the end of all this. Um, all the recommendations I just laid out for you um, provide a tax rate of $12.23 per thousand. Um, our current year is $12.08 per thousand, so it's up 15 cents. And then the, you can read the other notes there, but the one catch in all of this is what the state does with allowable growth. For instance, if they would increase allowable growth to two and three quarters or three percent, our tax rate would go down. Um, we'd be back to around $12. Uh, I don't know when we'll have that answer. What's everybody saying the answer is going to be? That's a guess. Between 1.25 and 4. Yeah, this thing is between 1.25 and 4. Probably close to 1.25 and 4. I would say that's probably right. I'd say that would be real close. Okay. Sorry, just My only thought in this whole thing, John, is, uh, you know, as we read some of these other notes that you have here, um, we're unspent. Uh, unspent. Authorized budget went from 2.1 million to 2.6 million. Yeah. And, and that's great news because we were seeing the trend the other way. The last uh, two fiscal years, we were at 3 million, we're at 2.5 million, we're at 2.1 million. Yeah. And it, it was an alarming trend. Um, the target for us should be around um, 10 to 20 percent of our general fund budget, and that's $10 million. So we should be 1 to 2 million. So. Um, we're above that range right now. Um, that's not going to go up another half million at the end of this year, I promise you. <laughs> that's just not happening. Um, hopefully it stays relatively flat with our goal. My thought was just, you know, with that $500,000 increase, or roughly, uh, you know, instead of increasing our tax rate, we could at least keep it the same at, at 12.08. And I don't, I mean, I don't have a, a magic formula of how to do that, but, no, but that really seems to be something that we could probably do. Yeah. And, and like you said, it depends a lot on what the, what the that, legislature does. So. That's just it. You know, we can look at um, 
less, less cash reserve levies and, and get that back in a hurry. Um, or we could um, maybe say we're only going to fund actual expenditures and management and bring that down 25 or 50,000. Yeah. Um, there's some things we can do, but until we really know what the state's going to do, um, we're not going to get this thing right on the nose with what we expect. Are we looking to approve the budget tonight or are we just looking at the bill? No, no. I wanted to get it in front of you. We've got two months. Call me. Um, you know, I guess. <clears throat> One recommendation I might have, let's put this on the March agenda under um, unfinished business. If everybody can agree that when the April meeting comes, we meet early prior to April 15th so we can uh, um, have our hearing and approve the budget. Will we know what the state's doing by then or not? I bet we, my guess is we won't know in May. But, okay. you know. I'm okay with what you just said on the March agenda. And then okay. I'll create back meeting. in the packet in March then and you can give me some feedback. And then we'll plan on approving it in April. Deal? All good. Great. Sounds good to me. Uh, okay. Does anybody else have anything to say? Uh, board members about that? Um, okay. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about it at the end of March. Uh, <coughs> eight personnel resignations. Um, Barb, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yep. We've got a couple of resignations. Um, the first is Amanda Laux, who's a high school uh, English teacher and speech coach for us, and that would be effective uh, Friday, February 13th of 2015, and I'd ask you to accept that uh, resignation. The second one is a resignation we received today, uh, which is from Aaron Goddard, who is a high school man <coughs> for us, and um, that would be effective at the end of the school year. So. Um, why don't you do those separately? Why don't you do them yeah. separately? The first would be for Amanda Lowe's. Um, hers would be effective February uh, 13th. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to accept <coughs> the resignation from Amanda Lowe's uh, effective Friday, February 13th. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed, nay. Okay. The second one then is Karen Goddard, who will complete the school year. In it. So it would be effective the end of the, the school year. That would be the end of her 185 day contract. I'll make that motion. Second. I have a motion and a second to accept the resignation from Aaron Goddard. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. She wrote a really nice letter too to make sure that we uh, thank her. She, has, she also was a uh, uh, robotics coach. Yeah. Uh, she did a good job. Yeah, that is too bad. But it's good for her. So. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have any contracts, right? No. Okay, discuss future agenda items and set date. Um, the date will be March 16th. No, no, no. And you should bring treats, right? <laughs> treats. Okay, I like those Christmas colors. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Yeah. A couple of things at least to talk about, right? Yeah, we'll put the budget back on this for sure. Uh, we've started negotiations, so that will always be our goal. Yeah, we'll be done by then. Yeah. Yeah, if you wanted. We might. That'd be good. We might not, also. <laughs> uh, one thing that I think that we should probably start talking about is the tech contract. Uh, you know, I was approached mm -hmm. several months ago about that. And, yeah, that's in July. It's a lot of we start on that. Well, yeah, I think we should just talk about what we want to do there at least. Are we board. speaking? I mean, is there, I, mean, I guess it's always good to, is that what you're talking about is putting out? I had, I had somebody from the community ask me if that's something that we bid out every year, and I told them, no, we don't. We've always just, uh, you know, we've had a lot of for how many years. Just two or three now, we've, and we've just renegotiated the first yeah. contract each year. So uh, that you know that means some things we'd have to uh, we'd have to get some specifications down, so we're doing the same thing. And so it's it's time consuming, and so I think it's something that the board probably needs to talk about. I mean, it's, if there hasn't any problems with what we're having now. Well, I don't think so. So it's no. not a matter of we're looking for somebody now because no, that's what I, I that the last time I kind of got asked that too was. You know, so. No, I, I don't think that is an already. Okay. 
I'm not sure it will be the March meeting, but March or April, I'm looking at that, we'll have a proposal probably for you for one-to-one -one devices at the middle school. Um, like our one-to-one -one rollout. I hope by March. Is all of that going good? openings for the current positions and um, doing some interviewing so um, hopefully we have some contract recommendations for you um, for the next board meeting too. Before you adjourn, just so you know, I do have a message from John Smith and they won't be back until quarter to nine at the airways. So we won't hear from John tonight. Heather, I'm all right. Heather, I'm match 93 out of 102 right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're an hour away. So. Well, he wants to talk to you for all the time, correct? Yeah. We'll talk to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I believe we're in here. Okay.